Hello everyone and welcome to the first in our material history seminar series for 2023, Unpicking Fashionable Objects. I'm Margaret Anderson from the Old Treasury Building and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us today. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I thank them for their care of culture and of country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. But I'd also like to acknowledge any First Nations people who may be joining us from elsewhere today. Material Histories is a seminar series offered jointly by the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. This particular event today is presented in the PayPal Melbourne Fashion Festival's Fashion Culture Program. In each of these discussions, we explore an aspect of material history through an object or series of objects. The seminars are open to anyone interested in material history, and we hope over time to cast the subject net widely in terms of both time and place. So if you're interested in contributing, please do get in touch. We'll pop some email addresses on the screen at the end of the seminar. Now, just a few words about the structure of the seminar before I hand over to our chair today. Although I'm sure you're all well used to digital seminars by now, just to confirm that this is in a webinar format, and so only the speakers and their slides will be visible on the screen. Your video and audio are both switched off. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screens and Katie behind the scenes will do her very best to help you. If you have a question, and we do hope you will, please use the Q&A button. And of course, keep your questions and comments courteous. Finally, a reminder that the webinar will be recorded. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce the co-convener of Material Histories, Lorinda Kramer, who will chair the discussion today. Dr. Lorinda Kramer is a research fellow in the Gender and Women's History Research Center in the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at ACU. She has a specialist interest in gender, dress and textiles, and in 2020 published her first book, Needlework and Women's Identity in Colonial Australia. Over to you, Lorinda. Thanks so much, Margaret, and hello, everyone. I'd like to join Margaret in welcoming you today to our Material History Seminar, Unpicking Fashionable Objects. I'm really thrilled to be chairing this seminar and to be introducing you to our three presenters whose work I admire immensely, Dr. Sarah Bendel, Professor Trish Fitzsimons and Madeline Shaw. We have a wonderful number of people joining us today to hear these presentations and I'm so pleased that you'll get to know more about the remarkable work that our three speakers are doing. So I'd first like to introduce Dr. Sarah Bendel. Sarah is a research fellow at the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at the Australian Catholic University. She's a material culture historian whose work specialises in the roles of gender, in the production, trade, and consumption of global commodities and fashionable consumer goods between 1500 and 1800. Sarah's paper has the really intriguing title, Whalebone and its Afterlife, Fashion Innovation, Adaption and Sustainability, circa 1600 to 1950. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> okay, so, Plastic and the ecological disaster that it is causing is one of the biggest environmental challenges that we face in the 21st century. So according to the United Nations Environment Program, every minute the equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic is dumped into our oceans, which can alter habitats and ecosystems, reducing their ability to adapt to climate change, which also directly affects food production and the well-being of millions of people around the globe. But what if I told you that in fashion, plastic once looked like the more sustainable option, or at least a great alternative to a widely used material whose sourcing has ca had caused a marine ecological disaster of another kind? 
So today I'm going to be talking about baleen. So baleen is the name given to keratinous plates in the mouth of baleen whales. So historically, this material was known as whalebone, even though it's not actually bone. It's made from keratin, which is what your fingernails and hair are made from. So like horn and tortoise shell, also types of keratinous materials, baleen is a type of natural thermoplastic owing to its ability to be heated and manipulated into various shapes. So for over 400 years, this product was sought after in manufacturing, um, owing to its unique flexibility, its strength, its malleability, and properties which we now value in synthetic plastics. So although whalebone was used in a wide variety of everyday objects um, by the 18th and the 19th centuries, um, its use in fashion was of primary importance. So my brief talk today, I want to give an overview of these historical entanglements between whaling and fashion and the synthetic materials that replaced whaling goods in order to explore how the historical uses of such materials intersect with concerns about innovation and manufacturing, economics and availability, as well as ethical questions about environmental sustainability of fashion. So when did it all start? So whaling was and still is common to uh, many indigenous cultures around the world who relied on these animals for their diet, as well as for fuel to create tools, items of dress and other things. But what I'm interested in is the large scale commercial whaling, which was pioneered by Basque whalers from what is now southern France and northern Spain, who created the first global commercial whaling industry along the shores of Labrador in what is now the Canadian province of Newfoundland in the 1530s. So um, if you can see my cursor, it's just around here. They started whaling, coming all the way from here. So although whale oil, which is made from the melted blubber of these animals, was the primary motivator for the hunt and the main commodity that was traded in the early, in the early 16th century, um, and actually it was used in textile manufacturing at this time, as well as to make soap and other lighting and fuel-related goods, so Basque whalers also brought back significant quantities of baleen that were traded throughout Europe. Before this, the materials first used to structure early modern fashion were usually locally acquired. So there were things like wood, wire, um, bents, which is a name for bunches of reeds, um, pasteboard, so a type of cardboard, animal glue, and bombast, which could be horsehair, straw, cotton, or wool. So anything used to stuff things. These materials were often um, employed alongside stiff or thick fabrics to structure garments worn by men and women. However, baleen was superior to these locally acquired natural products as it was more durable and longer lasting um, and it could be moldable, allowing for it to be used in a variety of ways that sort of pushed fashion further. So by the mid 18th century, whaling was carried out in all the areas I've circled on the map. Um, by, by the Basques, but also by the English, the French, the Dutch, the Germans, uh, Portuguese, and their colonies in sort of North and South America. So from the 16th uh, to the 18th centuries, uh, whalebone was used in a variety of products. So it was used in bodies and stays, which were the name for early corsets, um, stiffening in men's doublets, um, coats and jackets, particularly in the collars, um, it was also used in bonnets, parasols, fans, riding rods, and many, many other products. So by the 18th century, the use of whalebone in these types of garments had been perfected. So a pair of mid 18th century stays in the Museum of Arts and Applied Sciences in Sydney or the Powerhouse Museum, um, illustrate the use of whale baleen in a fully boned pair of stays during the century. So these stays can contain five millimeter wide boning channels, which I found is fairly typical of stays from the middle of the 18th century. The baleen is placed in each channel between two interlining layers of linen and buckram. And each long piece of baleen is a tiny one millimeter thick, except for some pieces at the center back, which have been cut thicker to give more sturdiness around the lacing holes. So this was a material that you could also manipulate and cut as fine or as thick as you wanted, depending on the flexibility that you needed. So the baleen contained in this garment most likely comes from either a bowhead whale or a North Atlantic right whale. So the baleen in these species was the most common um, type of baleen used in fashion at the time. So here you can see the baleen in the whale's mouth. So both were collectively known as the right whales as they had large amounts of blubber and large amounts of long and very fine baleen. So the, the, right, the right whales to hunt. Um, 
So the hooped, uh, hooped petticoats by the 18th century also contained baleen. So um, like this one in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Um, so hoop petticoats were often cited as a reason to revive the English um, whaling industry at the start of the 18th century. So at this time, um, the English were heavily dependent on imports from the Dutch Republic. The Dutch were the superior whalers of the 17th century. And then North Atlantic, uh, sorry, and they're also reliant on the North American colonies. So it was hoped that the consumption of women's skirts would fuel England's maritime economy. Yet whalebone was not the only material used in things like hoop petticoats. It continued to be used alongside many other types of stiffening materials, such as cane or rattan, um, which was imported in large quantities um, by the English East India Company by the 18th century. So cane and whalebone seem to have been so commonly substituted with each other during this period that several businessmen in London were labelled as cane and whalebone merchants. And you can see this is a trade card from the British Museum. So these uses of whalebone in fashion during the 18th century largely carried over to the start of the 19th century. So starting in 1798, whaling became one of colonial Australia's most important um, export industries. And for a time, it was the colony of New South Wales' largest grossing Australian export until 1833, when it was surpassed by another material that was widely used in um, clothing, which was wool. So during the height of this industry, from 1836 to 1840, Australia supplied Britain with over 60% of its oil and whalebone. Although the most valued types of baleen used in fashion still came from those whales that were hunted in the Arctic, in the north of the globe, um, the baleen exported by Australian whalers came from primarily the southern right whale, which is a cousin of the North Atlantic right whale and whose baleen is somewhat similar. So by the 19th century, uh, whalebone was used for umbrellas and parasol ribs and for the insertion into corsets and other articles of dress, um, which you can see here. Um, this is a lesson card from the late 19th century. Um, it could also be cut into strips for covering telescopes and wood handles made into brushes and the shavings were even used as stuffing. Yet by this century, whalebone, which had taken fashion trades and industries by storm in the 17th and the 18th centuries, was old technology. While there had been some advances in how it was processed, its basic use in fashion products was largely the same. So it's in this century that we begin to see whalebone alternatives. Sometimes this was due, uh, linked to the scarcity or the price of whale baleen as populations of these animals began to be overhunted and dwindled. However, it was also linked to new fashions and new technology. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a bit of nuance here. It's, it wasn't just that we killed all the whales. It, there were other technologies coming in. So between the years 1790 and 1830s, when baleen was abundant and available at good prices in most major markets around the globe, the design of Western women's clothing lent itself to a less structured silhouette. Women's stays and corsets from this period were only minimally boned, if at all. So in this case, fashion was not driving whaling at this time because it wasn't really using the baleen. So steel production also became much cheaper around the middle of the 19th century. And corsets during this time began to incorporate more and more of this into their design. So these are two 19th century corsets from the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. So they both have front um, sort of busks that are made from metal and they all um, contain uh, bits of met steel and baleen as well. So um, steel didn't totally replace baleen and many corsets from the mid to late 19th century contain a mixture of both steel and baleen. Um, and so when you're examining this garment, it's like these garments, it's, it's sort of easy to tell the difference. Steel is cooler to the touch under the fabric. It's also a lot stiffer. Baleen definitely has a lot more give and flexibility. So experimentation with materials also became common. During the 1870s and the 1880s in the United States, the Bridgeport Corset Company released corsets that were stiffened with coralline, which was made from a Mexican plant called Ixtil, the leaves of which were made into a firm continuous cord. So they're really sort of starting to experiment with whalebone alternatives during the 19th century. And some of this is sort of just the general industriousness of the 19th century. But by the end of the 19th century, it also became apparent that whalers had brought about a serious reduction in size of almost all traditionally hunted whales in all whaling grounds around the world. At this time, the market for whale oil had been largely replaced by new petroleum and mineral products, which were cheaper and more abundant. 
With oil needs met by mineral products, baleen was um, became, uh, which was primarily used in fashion at this time, became the sole motivator for commercial, for many commercial whaling ventures. And in shocking displays of human exploitation and greed, whales at this time often took the baleen and left everything else. So low supply also made whale baleen more expensive. This is why at this time claims to real baleen became commonplace. So whale bone was still regarded as the best material for garments such as corsets. And so the refrain that certain brands of corsets were boned with real baleen or real whale bone or guaranteed new baleen true and new baleen, sorry, became a common selling point, as you can see in these Australian examples, which are all at the Powerhouse Museum. So at this time, Australian newspapers also began to advise people on how to reuse their whale bones, stating that it was becoming more and more expensive. So while claims to real whale bone could be read as sales pitches that guaranteed the customer was getting the real deal in a market where supplies of baleen were dwindling, it also speaks to the superiority of this material in garments such as corsets in a market that was also increasingly dominated by things such as steel, by coralline, but also synthetic materials such as plastics. So semi-synthetic plastics such as cellulose nitrate were first invented in the 1840s and true artificial plastic such as parxine was, uh, which was a precursor to celluloid in the 1850s. Plastics came around for a variety of reasons, for use in munitions, for artificial silks, for photography, but also they were substitutes for natural materials such as ivory or tortoise shell, which were becoming increasingly rare and expensive. This collar um, from the US also makes me laugh a lot because it was also a way that you didn't have to iron and starch your collars. You could just have a plastic collar on your shirt as well. So in fact, the earliest plastics were used in ways that mimicked other natural moldable materials such as horn and of course, baleen. So starting in the 1920s, the popular Australian corset uh, and lingerie brand Burley, which we still have now, began to advertise that their corsets and girdles contained material that they called Burley bone, which appears to have been either some sort of metal or some sort of plastic boning. Rubber coated steel was also common at this time. And moving into the 1960s, um, plastic-like boning material was also really common in, um, in girdles and um, brassieres and things like that. So today, plastic is still used uh, for stiffening the bodices of modern clothing and of corsets, which is, of course, a trend that has recently re-emerged in fashion. So in the evolution of fashion and particularly corsetry, we've essentially replaced a natural plastic that was whalebone with a synthetic plastic in clothing. However, this begs the question, are our modern substitutes actually any better for the environment? Large scale whaling for centuries undoubtedly had negative effects on whale populations and the environment. And I'm of course not advocating that we return to whaling. But at the end of the day, baleen was a natural material that was able to be broken down and decompose over time. Plastic, on the other hand, as we know, takes hundreds of thousands of years to hundreds to thousands of years to degrade and is also having a negative impact on land and marine life. Is the solution then to go back to plastic alternatives such as reeds? So these were natural plant-based fibers that artisans and manufacturers turned to again and again throughout the 17th to the 19th centuries. And I didn't really have a chance to talk about that today, but these, these things don't go away, they, they keep coming back. So it's certainly a solution. However, with all aspects of fashion, both modern and historical, overconsumption leads to the exploitation of the natural world and its resources. So I found, as I was sort of putting this presentation together, this article on Ixtel, um, which is a natural plant fiber from Mexico that was used, if you can remember, um, that I just talked about, in the place of whalebone to stiffen some 19th century corsets. So... The indigenous Atami people from central Mexican state of Hidalgo, who traditionally used this material for hundreds of years, continue to resist offers from large national uh, corporations to make products on a mass scale um, because this is sort of seen as a good alternative to plastic. And the reason they keep refusing is that their production is not industrial and to fulfill such a request of such a volume, we would have to overexploit the land. By turning back to natural products then, whether they be animal or plant, we also risk re-exploiting the environment. But by relying solely on synthetics that we have now, we also risk clogging our oceans with plastic waste. Is the problem then really fashion and overconsumption? I unfortunately don't have the answers to those questions today. 
However, I wanted to throw out that question at the end. Um, because I hope that you'll see, as this talk has shown, that technology and innovation have been and continue to be vital to finding new materials in fashion, be they natural, synthetic. Um, and I'm sure we'll find another, hopefully, more environmentally friendly version of whalebone or boning in the future. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for your terrific paper. I enjoyed it so much. It gives us so much to think about in terms of fashion innovation and sustainability. And I suspect we're going to come back to some of these during our question and answer. But first, I'd like to introduce our other speakers for today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Madeline Shaw and Professor Trish Fitzsimons. Madeline is a textile curator, historian and author, recently retired from the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Institution. And Trish is a documentary filmmaker, historian, author, and adjunct professor of Griffiths Film School. They share a research project titled Fabric of War, A Hidden History of the Global Wool Trade. So Madeline and Trish will speak together on their paper, Needs Must, German Paper Suits and the Legacy of Wartime Woolen Shortages. Thank you, Madeline and Trish. Thank you, Lorinda. Can you hear me? Um, so, um, such, a, such a pleasure for Madeline and I to be here today. Thank you to the Treasury, Lorinda, Melbourne Fashion Week. Thank you to our audience. So, New Jersey's Newark Museum holds two suits made of spun paper yarns acquired in 1920 as examples of the response to cloth shortages faced by Germany and her allies during World War I. As a fashion curiosity, the suits have some interesting details of cut and construction, but their historical context links fashion with politics, military strategies, economic warfare, and eventually the triumph of synthetic over natural fibers. This is the subject of our book in process, Fleeced, Wool, War, and the Rise of Synthetic Textiles. Fleeced is grown out of the Fabric of War, a hidden history of the global wool trade project that Madeline and I have shared for several years. Having started out exploring the link between wool and war, we discovered that what we were uncovering too was a history of synthetic textiles. This suit is a way into that. Many years ago, I came across a reference to German civilians wearing clothing made of paper yarns towards the end of World War I as the British blockade strangled German trade and prevented imports of wool needed to clothe both soldiers and civilians. It wasn't relevant to what I was working on at the time, but I stored it away for future reference and lo and behold, decades later, came across those Newark Museum suits, jackets, trousers, and even as you can see here, braces made entirely of twisted paper yarns. That is yarns made from narrow strips of a kind of craft paper spun or twisted into a very smooth yarn and treated with a sizing finish for a bit of water resistance. They had been collected by two different Newark businessmen, one of them in the paper industry in Germany after the armistice. The paper yarns, both warp and weft, have been woven into fabric and then cut and sewn into relatively unstructured garments. The suits at first glance look like a tweed, as you can see here from the detail of the back collar of one. They are both a two-tone twill weave, this one in brown and tan, the one in the previous slide in black and a light blue gray. The seams are stitched just as for any cloth, and the feel of the suit fabric is flexible, if not actually drapey, but there is a bit of bias stretch if you tug on the The cut is a simplified version of the ordinary man suit of the 19 teens. A boxy jacket with only four pocket buttons, patch pockets, and a simple round collar with basic shaping in the sleeve seam and the side back seam. The trousers are more fitted and more conventionally cut with a standard back waist belt, buttons for the braces to attach to, and side seam pockets. They are not cuffed. A February 1921 article in the American magazine Popular Science described paper clothing as still manufactured and worn in Argentina, 
Austria, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, and Turkey at a cost of the equivalent of 59 cents for a workman's suit, $1.40 for a man's suit such as this one, and 47 cents for a shop coat. So on the surface, the suit represents a novel use of paper in an economic situation where resources were severely restricted. But so many questions arose. Was weaving fabric from paper yarns a new wartime invention? How widespread was its use? What was the actual technology involved? Was it just a German thing? And finally, was it actually any good and didn't have any, did it have any lasting impact? So our project has filled in some of these details. East Asia, particularly Japan, has a long history of paper yarns and textiles, but in Europe, I wasn't so sure. In 2015, at the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian, in one of a set of boxes labeled consular materials, I found a jumble of dozens of skeins of paper yarns in many thicknesses, weights, and colors, and samples of the products woven from them, suitable for a range of end uses from rugs to wall coverings. All of this material was collected by the US consul in Plauen, Germany in 1907, and his report on this new yarn, which was named Xylalin, uh, patented by German inventor Emil Clavius, was reprinted by newspapers and trade, textile trade journals across the United States, and actually also in Australia. Clavius, in the company named Textilos, patented machinery and processes in several countries before World War I, Germany, France, England, and the US. The product was also touted as sacking to replace jute. Wool fleece, for example, picked up fibers from jute bags that had to be removed by a process called carbonizing, lest they spoil a, a woven cloth. Clearly, the wartime paper yarn products were not completely new technology, but one adapted and refined to meet a new need. As more and more pieces have been found, it's clear that when textile resources ran short, paper yarns were pressed into service for many uses, not merely household furnishings and menswear. You can see here paper textiles used as underwear and a child's dress in, civilians li in civilian life, but also in a range of military uses. There is particular poignance in the paper yarn putty wrapped around a prosthetic leg at uh, top right recovered from a German pilot who died when his plane was shot down in France in May, 1918. The official report on this was that the pilot was just a boy, which evokes as well the wastage of human life in war. Gail Romano at the Auckland War Memorial Museum recently discovered in storage, a stash recovered by a New Zealand military unit from Turkey, including band paper bandages and mattress covers which suggests the widespread shortages of textiles on the whole German side of the war, not just in Germany and Austria. The Auckland group confirms the military usage of spun paper textiles. You see here examples from a large collection at the Smithsonian of those used by the German army, hatchet and trench shovel covers, ammunition pouches, feed bags for horses, slings and hammocks, packs for bicycles or motorcycles, truck and wagon covers. They were collected as salvage by the US Army at the end of the war, and then selected for the Smithsonian by curator Frederick Luton in 1923, specifically because American anxieties over how to source wool and other textile fibers in wartime had not lessened after the armistice. In 2017, Trish and I were at a World War I conference in New Zealand, and mentioned these objects to representatives of the Dresden War Museum in Germany. They shook their heads saying, oh no, the army never used paper, it was a civilian thing. Well, we beg to differ. In the Central Powers by 1916, wool was increasingly scarce. A post-armistice intelligence summary from the US Third Army dated November 20th, 1918, reported on the condition of the French in the regions invaded by the Germans. Recent orders also required the taking of blankets, wool from the mattresses, and even shoddy cloth. Other occupied regions suffered similarly, as seen in the photograph of Serbia at right. 
confiscated wool, whether taken from storehouses or mattresses, was sent to Germany to be processed into yarn, a symptom of the dire need for wool that gripped Germany after its pre-war stockpile had been depleted. The Germans used many substitutes apart from paper, some in development before the war, cellulose acetate or artificial silk, later called rayon, cattail fiber, stinging nettle, a bast or stem fi fiber rather like linen, an Australian seaweed that was dubbed posidonia, and a treated ramy fire they called solidonia, which an American commerce official looking into German textile industries post-war said was used in German uniform cloth during the war at a ratio of about 25% solidonia and 75% wool. Jute fibers were treated with caustic soda <clears throat> in a process that was called woolenizing to mix with and eke out wool supplies. On the whole, these substitutes, including paper, were found to be inadequate. Rayon, based on wood cellulose, would have much additional development between the world wars. Shortages and therefore substitutes were not only an issue for Germany and her allies. In Britain, France, and eventually the US, conserving wool was made a patriotic duty. Damaged and worn uniforms were repaired and reissued, but not at least in the US and the UK to soldiers at the front, only to trainees or to the labor corps or to POWs. If beyond fixing, the wool from them was reclaimed as shoddy the textile industry term for recycled wool fiber. The Allies tested many of the same fibers as the Central Powers, Ramy, Cattail, and Milkweed Floss, and likewise dismissed them. Some British and French paper clothing of a very different quality to the German material has also survived from the Great War. Most of it was really a pulp paper product, perhaps originally more pliable than regular paper, but not what you might call comfortable to wear. The Newark Museum's records say this was apparently meant for wartime hospital use. Even the British who knew where they could get wool but didn't always have the shipping necessary to transport it, explored paper yarn technology during the war, primarily for uses similar to the cache of German military objects at the Smithsonian. The Textilite Engineering Company, possibly using confiscated patents from Clavier's Textilose company, displayed products and a yarn spinning machine at the British Scientific Products Exhibition in August 1918 in London. The red arrow you can see points to the reel of paper in place on the machine, which would have held and spun six reels into yarn at one time. Wool shortages were not just about the quantities needed by the huge armies. In World War I, the British government treated its privileged access to its empire's wool as a strategic advantage, denying wool to its enemies and restricting its sales to allies and neutrals. But wool was essential to the survival of troops in warfare, especially in the long-term cold climate style of most World War I combat. In October 1916, the British government finalized contracts for the compulsory purchase of the entire clip from Australia and New Zealand. Similar arrangements differing in detail were made with India and British South Africa. One US response was the spread of sheep clubs. Once the US joined the war in 1917, a flock of 40 sheep even grazed on the White House lawn. Textile manufacturers in the US and UK worried about satisfying their civilian companies and about their ability to meet demand, not only from allied combatant nations, but also from neutral countries who now needed alternative sources of supply. In the interwar period, every manufacturing nation sought workable substitutes for the raw materials that another war could again put out of reach. Governments, military establishments and textile industrialists took the wartime lessons to heart and research and development of many kinds of fibres was put on the front burner. The semi-synthetic rayon, like paper based on cellulose, but with much more chemical processing, was in common use from the 1920s and fully synthetic nylon appeared in 1939. 
but they were not satisfactory substitutes for wool. Unfortunately, the Great War was not the war to end all wars, and textiles of all kinds, foremost amongst them wool, were once more central to the lives and health of soldiers and civilians during World War II. So there is a direct lineage from paper yarns to polyester, currently both the most common textile fiber and the biggest single source of microplastic pollution. And apparently we've doubled how much plastic we've used in the last 20 years. So um, it's a problem. Germany's desperate use of paper textiles in the Great War is vital to understanding how the common occurrence of war in the 20th century and shortages of wool in same led to the creation, rigorous marketing and current ubiquity of synthetics. Look out for our book to come, Fleeced, Wool, War and the Rise of Synthetic Textiles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trish and Madeline. I'm going to be at the front of the queue to purchase your book. I just found that so fascinating and full of surprises. Before we open for questions from our audience, and I do encourage you to, to start to pop your questions in our Q&A function, I'm interested in briefly exploring the, the, the similarities and differences in your approaches to working with objects, Sarah, Trish and Madeline. You know, with your work spanning that of the historian, the curator, the filmmaker, I wondered if I could encourage all three of you to respond to each other's papers, perhaps with a, a question or a reflection about what struck you most about working with material objects to help unpick fashion. Uh, shall I go first? Am Madeline, please do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting how to raise my hand in these things. <laughs> um, I, I did work at the New Bedford Whaling Museum for a time, uh, and we had quite a lot of, of uh, whalebone of baleen and also big giant uh, things of baleen st uh, in storage as well that hadn't been, that had just come off the uh, a whale. Um, how did you find, Sarah, the... Um, the conservation of that material uh, in the, the many uh, places that you have been to look at to, to, to find it. Uh, did you find that there were any issues with conserving that material? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, definitely in a lot of the examples I've looked at, it has broken over time. So, um, in various like dress bodices and some of the stays and corsets, which I, which is obviously like an issue for, for conservation. Um, but it's also something I find really intriguing as well as historian, because part of the work I'm doing is um, because I'm really sort of taking, I guess, it back to the start of the, you know, to the 16th century when somebody first came across this material, you know, Indigenous people had used it before but you know somebody a European comes across this material and is like hey I'm gonna put this in a dress and you're like you kind of think how do they go from looking at you know and you would have seen them all Madeline these sort of long pieces of stuff out of a whale's mouth how do we get from that to then like a corset and so I'm really interested in and I guess you know it's it this is sort of where there's similarities in your talk how do people innovate and how do people look at things and and you know, um, turn it into something completely different? How do you look at a piece of paper and turn it into a thread and then like weave it into a piece of cloth? Um, but yeah, so it's always really fascinated me because in a lot of these examples, there are broken or very fragile bits of baleen. And it's always sort of struck me because a lot of the, the stuff you read about baleen is it's a great material because it's so flexible and it doesn't break. So part of me is wondering, um, but then you also get... Um, Sort of glimpses into people where they're saying they're having to replace the whalebone in their stays because it has broken. So I don't know whether it gets more brittle. I think it gets more brittle over time. Mm. And that's a conservation, um, something conservation needs to be aware of. But I think that's also really interesting in 
um, in terms of reuse of this product and people reusing it, but people also having to replace it. And um, also the value of, of this material, like does it get, does it have a shelf life? It gets to a certain point and then it's not really usable anymore. Um, so yeah, I can't really speak as much the conservation side because I'm not obviously a curator or a conservator, but I, they're the sort of questions that that has sort of ignited for me in looking at so many of these objects and seeing just where bits are broken, usually in the pressure points, you know, at the waist and things like that. That the idea of a shelf life uh, on, on any consumer product is a really interesting one. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for Sarah or, or first to comment. I really liked your nuanced understanding of the environmental impact of different materials. You know, it, it's absolutely fascinating that plastic in the first instance saved us from from killing whales for, for whale bone. And that relates, I can see to a question Deb Tout smiths gonna be asking, but coming to the current moment where plastic mm. clearly ain't a solution, or if, if plastic's the solution, I think it's the wrong question. Have you found any focused interest in replacing plastic and um, including textiles based on plastic in fashion currently? I mean, maybe I don't know if you're a fashion historian, whether that's a, a, a fair question, but I really wonder. Yeah, yeah. I must admit, I don't look as much at modern fashion as I do a historical, obviously. Um, I think it's really interesting because I think, um, and, you know, I, I think this goes to what we were sort of talking about before the session started, is a lot of people don't actually have the knowledge anymore to understand what is actually in their clothing and what it's actually made of. I think a lot of people don't, understand fibers don't understand you know when you read that label and you read rayon polyester what what do you know what that actually means and so i think you know obviously there is a push to use less synthetics in clothing and i know certainly myself and people like me i tend to avoid clothing that is made from synthetic fibers um, I tend to try and stick to natural fibers, but I think unless you have that education to begin with, it's quite hard. And, you know, there are a lot of really great now synthetic fibers um, that actually, you know, the, re the main reason I don't like polyester is because I feel like I'm sweaty in it all the time, but there are a lot of great polyesters now that, you know, are very breathable. So I wouldn't say, I mean, I don't think there's a huge push against synthetic fibers. I think there's a, a push to make synthetic fibers better. I think there's a push to use semi-synthetic fibers more, so rayon, um, viscose, that type of thing. But I think really for there to be a push for people to reject synthetic fibers, people actually have to understand what's in their clothing a bit more. And you know, and and that that is hard, you know, because why would you why would you know that unless you're someone like us who works with textiles and clothing or is in the fashion industry? So I think there needs to be more education about what is actually what your clothing is made from. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And did you want to respond to Madeline and Trisha's paper? Yeah, um, I was going to say, I, I think this is more of a, a comment, I think, than a question, but it was it really struck me the sort of synergies between our papers, even though we're obviously looking at very different things, and sort of this question um, that I think, you know, I've been thinking about, but definitely you guys touched on, is like, what pushes innovation in fashion? Is it supply and demand is, you know, shortages, for example, as, you know, your paper was discussing shortages in certain materials. Is it sort of power and empire? Because that was, that's sort of something I've looked at in, um, in my work on whalebone, just how, um, you know, different nations competing with each other for maritime domination in all aspects of maritime activities and how that is used as a way to well, in a way, you know, in the early 18th century, as I sort of touched on, like, the English um, aren't very good whalers in the 17th century. Um, and it's really in the 18th century, there's renewed pushes for them to reignite their whaling industry, which they do, and obviously it becomes quite successful. Um, but, you know, one of the primary sort of motivators that people sort of draw on is, you know, um, if women if women wear more of these skirts, then we'll need more whalebone that will sort of push us to have to go out and catch it ourselves. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm sort of 
I was struck by, yeah, that question, what sort of pushes fashion innovation? And I wonder if you wanted to like touch on that a little bit more, you know, obviously war and is short and shortages uh, is one thing, but, you know, in, I guess, cause you're working more in that world of 20th century synthetics, what do you really see as sort of pushing the synthetics? So I'm I'm not qualified to answer that question holus bolus. I'll leave that to the um, fashion historians like Lorinda. I think it, it's a fascinating question, but certainly in relation to wool as a strategic resource and then the alternatives, it's mm -hmm. absolutely clear that governments pushing like what what has given us synthetics so comprehensively today is not just that they're um, better, in, in my opinion, with the rarest of um, exceptions, that's not true. It's certainly that they're cheaper, the raw materials are cheaper, um, and the amount of processing is, is cheaper than, than wool as a, a natural fibre, but it's the dedicated marketing and Italy is such a great example of that. So in Italy in the in the 30s, people like Marinetti, who audience members may be aware of as, um, as the futurist and closely connected with the Italian um, fascist government of Mussolini, he's writing poems extolling the virtues of, of Lanatal, which is actually a, a substitute based on on wool, it's mm. stick, I mean, not based on wool, what am I saying, based on milk, but Italy in the 30s has, um, they're really, really pushing rayon and they have trucks trundling down around the um, Italian countryside and they have signs of like the sun on the top of the, um, the truck and people can come in and test out rayon and they're playing music and there's poems and, and, from the American end, part of DuPont's great success is again this absolutely massive focus on marketing. And, um, and along with that too, various governments in the face of shortages of raw materials actually mandate blends. So, you know, we are so used to now to kind of cotton rayon mixes or, or rayon wool or whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. that again has a strategic history. So I can't answer in any comprehensive fashion, but I can certainly say when you look at the strategic dimensions of textile history, it's absolutely clear um, that governments and big corporations um, act to create demand. Wonderful. Trisha, thank you so much for, for that response. Now, I think we've had some really great questions starting to come into our, our, into our chat function. So I'm going to get stuck into questions for you. And Trisha's already mentioned a question from Deb Tout smith Deb, it's a fascinating question. So she writes, are these kind of substitute materials that are produced by Germany, so all alternatives, you know, they're typically presented as part of a narrative of, of German failure or German desperation and allied success. But as they were being developed well before World War I, at a time when there was so much experimentation with materials, can we sometimes read this as a use of modern futuristic materials and not always as a storage of, of shortage and, and failure? So were these substitutes, if we call them that, actually viable alternatives? It's a, it's a thought-provoking question, right? It is, um, and some of them were uh, good and useful, um, but for the most, and some of them were in, in development before the world, before World War I. So obviously rayon was, um, but also posidonia. I think the, um, the one that is based on the Australian uh, seaweed uh, was also before the war. Um, but I think what makes them really, but they're never good enough to take the place of the cotton, the silk, the 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 wool, the linen, um, stinging nettle is something that's used a lot. Uh, people are trying to revive that, 
Um, but in many cases, it's the processing of those fibers is so much more time consuming the gathering of those fibers. They have not necessarily been um, uh, agriculturally produced on a large scale. So it's, it's trying to get this stuff back into a, a different place. Um, they tried to woolenize jute so that they could incorporate it into, you know, spin it with wool. And I just cannot imagine what that must have felt, felt like on, I mean, jute bags are rough and, and nasty, you know, nettle fiber. Yeah, you can see, but it, the jute, I, I, I'm still, I'm still on, on the fence about that one. Um, so I do think that for many of these substitutes, for instance, uh, Trish mentioned lanitol, which is a, a an extruded fiber from casein, just not from cellulose pulp. It, it was terrible. It was a terrible fiber. It smelled like wet, sour milk when it got wet. It it was really weak and they they tried everything. The Italians tried everything to make that work and including mandating it. And then the Americans tried, only they called it um, Aralac, and uh, during the war, I think they took those patents and just ran with them. And they too mandated these blends. Well, people couldn't get rid of it fast enough once they had to actually, you know, worn it in the rain once and walked around smelling like sour milk. So I, I think that essentially it was pushing for these fibers to be blended, to be mandated. And the fact that they weren't horrible necessarily. They weren't great, but for the, for the most part, for a lot of the world, that's all you had and you got used to it. And the, but also the, the, the public relations was just relentless about how modern and fabulous and new. And, you know, is when I worked close to the garment industry in New York city, the buzzwords were it's young, it's fresh, it's checking. Yes, <laughs> you know, rayon, yay. But it also, you know, you'd walk down the street in a rainstorm and your dress would go from below your knees to, um, you know, hip length because it would shrink. So, yeah. Can I say one thing very quickly? Because to, I mean, polyester, um, it's the biggest single source of microplastic pollution, you know, just, and we're, we're starting to find, you know, mm -hmm. microplastic pa particles in breast milk, you know, in, in, in babies' bodies, in, in brains, in fish. So um, I think it is very important that we're not saying, you know, wool is, is a perfect fiber that's where I really like the nuance of Sarah's presentation you know like sheep have had a negative impact on the Australian environment and and going back in the historic historical record you've got um, um, pastoralists in in the western districts of Victoria 10 years after their first arriving in Australian Felix talking about environmental degradation so I think somehow um, fast fashion, the amount of textiles that we're all using is as big a problem as actually what the textiles are that we're using. Somehow we need a marketing campaign that gets us all to have fewer textiles, but ones that we love and treasure and look after and reuse. And um, yes, yeah, so, so, Whilst I, I can't get terribly excited about polyester, Deb, neither um, neither is is wool some kind of um, um, perfect answer that we can just use as much as we want of either. They're they're precious, and nor is cotton, which yeah. you know has destroyed the RLC and large parts of of uh, most of the world <laughs> where it's agricultural. Now, I'm, I'm conscious that we're progressing ever closer to the, the hour, but I did want to get in hopefully just a couple more questions. And I want to combine two of our questions. 
because we're now thinking present day, um, moving on from, from what you've both been saying, I wanted to combine a question for Sarah and a question for, for Madeline and Trish about present day. So Sarah, can you explain how the extill, if I pronounce that correctly, fibres are treated to be used in, in clothing? And Madeline and Trish, is there anyone creating clothing grade paper yarn now? Sarah, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I've never, obviously, I've never, I've, I've not been to Mexico to see it, <laughs> to see the production process. But from what I can gather is the sort of the Ixil plant actually looks a little bit like aloe vera. Um, but when you cut off what looks like aloe vera um, and you break it apart, it already breaks up into fibers and I think they process it much the same way and you process flax or into linen or any of those other types of sort of linen e fibers so hemp flax that type of thing so it's sort of the fibers are broken up and beaten out and then um spun into into a yarn um, that is how I understand it I mean I've also seen pictures of them sort of laying out in the sun again similar to linen production so I would say you know without having seen it done in person um, from what I can ascertain it's similar to yeah linen fiber production great thanks Sarah and Madeline Trish are there any any paper yarn spinners um i I'm not positive about this, but I think that in Japan, uh, the source of many things, um, uh, textile uh, innovation these days, that they, because they have this long history of using mulberry paper and uh, other kinds of, of uh, materials, I, I believe that I was told that they are experimenting with um, a paper yarn that is a twisted paper. So much like the craft paper. I just don't know if they're using the same kind of machinery. Um, you know, certainly that's all out of copyright and or out of the patents expired and all of that. So it could easily be redone. Um, but I'm not sure about, about that. Mm, that's I right. wonder if um, Mark Kolansky's book, paper might have the answer, but yes, I don't. Um, I don't know. It, I've found it fascinating to think about the relationship between paper and rayon. Madeline would say I've been dim on this point, but because they're both, you know, essentially from, from cellulose pulp. But the thing about rayon, and this comes back to, to Deb again, rayon, the amount of chemical treatment to turn that cellulose into a liquid that can then get extruded. Our book is going to talk quite a lot. Madeline's written a fabulous um, chapter about, about rayon and, you know, workers never recover from working in rayon factories, you know, and I think most of the world's rayon factories are now in China. Um, and it's not necessarily clear that those workers are protected. So I think, yes, fewer textiles that are more precious to us has to be the answer. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It's not clear that paper necessarily, you know, can can hold its um, structure to to um, be be as precious as we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Now, I'm, I'm conscious we have some other fabulous questions, but we also are about to, to leave for the hour. So I'm so sorry that we're not going to have a chance to, to get to those ones. What I'd like to do is to really warmly thank Madeline, Trish and Sarah for their absolutely terrific papers. I, I enjoyed them so much and I can see from these questions and, and engagement with our audience that we'll be thinking about these objects long after we leave today. I'd also like to thank the team behind the Material History Seminar Series, the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. So our next seminar in the Material Histories Seminar Series is Australian Food Icons on Friday the 5th of May. And we'd love it if you can join us for that. So let me thank you again for your attendance, your interest, your participation. We've really greatly enjoyed having you with us. Please do have a look at the Material Histories page on the Old Treasury Building website for future seminars, or if you have an idea for a future seminar. Thank you again, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.